Okay, hello, welcome back to the basic Python course. This is session six. Last week we were dealing with um, iteration, so building loops in Python, and today the topic will be functions. Um, before we start with actual coding in Python, um, let's have a brief discussion of the concept of functions in general. So. Um, you probably know the function, the concept of a function from mathematics. And in mathematics, functions are very broadly understood as mappings from one set of objects to another set of objects, for example, numbers. And often in mathematics, the function can be described by a certain formula or equation, as in this case, uh, where we have y equal to f of x equal to x to the power of three. So in this case, um, f will be the name of the function. And this is a function mapping from the set of real numbers to the set of real numbers. So you give a real number in and you get a real number out. Uh, these two sets are called domain and codomain. So the domain is the set from which a function is getting its input. And the codomain is the set to which the subject supplies its output. Um, in a function, the x and y are also called argument and return value. And we will learn today um, what we can do with functions in Python. Similar to mathematics, encoding functions take something as input and give something as output. Uh, but they can they can do more things along the way. And we will see today how. So um, I'm switching to the Spider IDE. And uh, I want to start with a few examples. So um, this is actually not the first time we are working with Python. We're, we are working with functions. So today uh, will be the first time that we write a function on our own. But um, we have been using functions all the time. For example, <clears throat> we have been using the built-in function input for gathering user input. So we can write down name equal to input. What is your name? I'm going to type my name. And then I have my name stored in a variable. And I can use that to call another built-in function called print which then uses the contents of this variable, in this case, a string variable, to print text to the console. Um, we have also seen the function len or length, which gives us the number of elements in a sequence or the number of characters in a string. So in this case, this would be five. And we have seen uh, special kinds of um, functions, namely methods, which are like functions, but uh, always associated to a certain, to a specific data type. Yeah? This is, for example, the string method upper, which takes the string, um, transforms all letters into uppercase, and then returns the string as output. OK, so the general function in um, Python, the general syntax for functions in Python is pretty straightforward. You take uh, the function name, then type uh, parentheses, and then you give it some variable as an input. And optionally, if you want to store the output of this function in another variable, you can just um, write another variable name to the left of it and connect them with an equation sign. So <clears throat> as I already said, the things that go into the function and let the function do its work are called arguments. This is not to be understood as argument in the philosophical sense, which is something introduced in the discussion, um, but more generally as supporting information. The output of a function is called the return value or the return values of this function. And finally, um, the whole command 
invoking this function is called a call. So we are calling the function. You can think of this as uh, in the sense that the function is available in some space and whenever we need it, we call it to ourselves in order to be able to use it. Now, um, some objects are functions and some others are not functions, obviously. So if we define something which is not a function, like the integer number 42, um, we can obviously not call this as a function. So when we try to do this, we will get an error message uh, saying that the int object is not callable. That is, we cannot um, use it to do a function call. Then there are certain things which are functions, such as the length function, but they require a very specific number of arguments. For example, we cannot call the length function without input. If we do this, we get an error message saying that um, we should, uh, uh, that this function takes exactly one argument and uh, zero have been given. So the same happens when we are giving two arguments to this function, we also then get the same uh, error message simply because the length function needs exactly one argument. Otherwise, it's not clear uh, what it should calculate the length of. OK, however, there are also functions which can take a different number of arguments. For example, we can call the print function with several arguments. And what the print function is doing then is that it takes all those arguments and prints them one after another, doing some type conversion if necessary, and putting a space between them. Uh, as such, print also allows to be um, called with no arguments other than length, in which case it just prints an empty line. However, even if uh, there's a function which takes no arguments or a function which can be called without arguments, we still need to write the parentheses. So just writing the function name will not work. Um, we just give us, uh, report back to us that this object is a function, but will not do anything. Okay, some functions also take named arguments and one of them is actually the print function. So if I type the following command, we know what's going to happen. Um, print command uh, prints all these words and puts spaces in between them. And now let's here add another argument saying sep equal to dot, 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 and and equal to exclamation mark. So in that case, we get the following output. And based on this output, you can already work out that sep probably means separator, means that those are the characters that are put between successive arguments in the print command. And end is probably the end character put at the end uh, of the print command after the last argument has been printed. So these types of um, argument are called keyword arguments. Um, keyword arguments are uh, different from positional arguments in the sense that um, you have to supply the exactly correct name in order to use them. So for example, if we replace end and sep here by x and y, it wouldn't work because there are no keyword arguments of print called x and y, and Python wouldn't know by itself what 
we mean by X and what we mean by Y, whether one of them is the separator and one of them is the end character. So in this case, we also get an error message and uh, keyword arguments are different from variables where you can typically choose yourself um, which name you want to give to them. Mm. Keyword arguments also have default values. So if I leave them unspecified, I get uh, the default behavior of the function. And the default behavior of the function, as we already know, is to add a space between the arguments of print and add a new line or line break at the end of the character. So we could invoke the same procedure by um, specifying sep as a single space and end as a new line character. So this would generate the same output. However, there's no need to do this because uh, these are the default values of the keyword arguments and you don't need to call them if you want to work with the default arguments. Just to clar clarify this point with the um, new line character, whenever you use backslash, this is called an escape character and it's intended to signify that now something special is coming up, which should not be printed as is, but which is some non-printable character. There is, for example, the new line character, which introduces a line break, and then there's also backslash T, I believe, which introduces a tabulator space. Um, and we can make that clear by uh, adding a few more lines, new lines here, and then you can see that we have very large space below the uh, output of print invoked by these uh, five new line characters. So in that, in that way, you could, for example, do the following. So with the first print command, we were um, requiring the end character to be um, the empty string. So nothing to be done. You can also make that a space um, in order to make the transition look nicer. And um, if that is the case, uh, print doesn't add a new line after it has printed the last input argument. And um, we uh, immediately continue with the next output to the console, with, which is generated by this print command. And in this way, everything would be on the same line. OK, so as I already said, um, the output um, values of functions are also called return values, meaning that in that case, name would be a return value. Of the function input, and we can then use this return value to do further things and to use it for further calculations as in this case, um, outputting to the users. Uh, how many letters their names have. Okay, with that, we can also ask ourselves whether the print uh, function has a return value. So for example, if I print the word hello and then 
submit the output of the print function into a variable named text, then we print the word hello. This is what we already know. But um, what is the con what is what is the content of the variable text? And naturally, we would believe that it now contains the word hello. But if we ask for the type of this variable, we get none type. And if we print it, uh, we simply get none. So to understand this, we need to make an important distinction, namely the distinction between what a function is doing and what a function is returning. So what a function is doing for the print function is to print out text to the console. That's the sole purpose of the print function. Uh, but that doesn't mean that the print function also has a return value. It doesn't give us something back when we are using it in a script uh, that we can later work with. The print function has no return value. And we already learned that functions that um, return nothing, in Python, uh, simply return none. None in Python is uh, something that is not defined or that is intended to be left unspecified. So that means that whenever you have a function uh, which has no return values, you will get none as output. And everything uh, which a function is doing that is not related to its return values is called a side effect of this function. So um, paradoxically, the fact that print prints text is should be would be considered a side effect of this function. Uh, remember that we were also having a look at list method, list methods in one of the early sessions of this seminar. And there we learned that um, as lists are mutable, list methods are directly changing or modifying the lists without returning the modified lists as output arguments, such that when you then write the output of list methods back into uh, the same variable, you get none. Um, so the actions of list methods in uh, changing or modifying the lists would also be considered side effects. OK, so the functions that we have seen so far are all built-in functions. Yeah? So we used input, print, and length. and um, we know that those functions are available because they belong to the Python programming language. But um, obviously, there will be situations in which we in which we want to do something else, in which we want to do something for which there is no built-in function. And in that case, we will have to write a function ourselves. So. Today, our goal will be to write a function um, which takes a name, such as this one, no uh, endorsement implied, and then returns the initials um, of this name that was given as an input to this function. Yeah? So in this case, the output should be EM, as these are the initials of Elon Musk. Good, so with that, I want to open a new script and start coding. So I first define a few names here from which I want to retrieve the initials. OK, and what we could do now is first um, write a script, which accomplishes the task that we want to solve, and then later see how we can transform this into function. We already know how that works, because we were doing this uh, when we wrote the David Hesselhoff script. So let's just write down usernames, username, well, let's maybe for clarity only call this names. And then username split. Split is a string method which 
takes a string, splits it at every position where there is space, and returns the separate strings as a list of strings. So from that, we will get a list of two strings containing the words Elon and Musk. Then we can, from that, retrieve the first and the last name by uh, taking the first and second element from the list of splitted words. And based on this, we can obviously also generate the initials by taking the first letter from the first name and the first letter from the last name. So I'm going to save this. OK, and if I now run the script, I get EM as an output. So everything is working fine. Uh, now the question is, how do we apply this to the other nodes? Um, pretty straightforward solution would consist in the following. So we would simply take the code that we have written and apply it to the other names where in each copied version of the code, we only have to replace the username by, in this case, Leon's name and the uncle's name. And then we get the user ID for the username and the aunt's ID and the uncle's ID. And we can print all those. So to do this, we get EM, JD, and JD for Jane Doe and John Doe. Fine. So um, the, obviously, this is not the right solution. So this is not the way how we should do it. Uh, first of all, um, it's laborious. You have to code, copy code again and again. And depending on how many items you want to apply your function to, this can take quite some time. Second, it's error prone. So we are just human beings and uh, it's not guaranteed that we always uh, remember of replacing everything that we have to replace in the new code, which is then applied to new items. Uh, so this is again, um, an example of a wet programming style where you write everything twice. And what we of course want to achieve is a dry programming style um, in which we don't repeat ourselves. Okay, so we want to write a function which uh, satisfies the following conditions. Function should be called get initials. And if we um, give it a name, it should return the initials for this name, in this case, EM for Elon Musk. So I'm going back to my slides. So here's a summary of our objective for today. Object, our objective is to write a function. The function should be called get initials, and it should take the following things. It should take a string argument containing two names, such as the ones that we were just working with, and then it should return a new string containing the initials of those names. That is the first letter from first name and last name. And our function should take two additional keyword arguments, n and uppercase. n should be an integer, specifying the number of initial letters to use from first name and the last name. Default value should be one, producing the initials that we usually use. And um, uppercase should be a Boolean variable, so true or false, specifying whether the initials should be given back in uppercase or lowercase. Uh, this should by default be false uh, to produce lowercase emissions. And in addition to this, if we have achieved all that, um, uh, an additional requirement would be that the function 
to produce an informative error message if the input argument does not contain exactly two names. Uh, for example, if someone is only writing down their first name or if someone is giving their middle initial or things like that. Okay, so let's uh, have a look at this objective and uh, think of what ingredients we, we, we need for our function. So the function name should be get initial. The argument of the function should be a string, a single string containing at least one space. And the output of the function should also be a string uh, containing the initials. And then there should be uh, keyword arguments, uh, which should in some or other way control the behavior of the function. So here is the general syntax of functions in Python. You write dev, that stands for define. And then you write the function name, parentheses, then some arguments, and optionally keyword arguments. Then you write a colon, new line, and indentation. So a function, just like uh, an if clause and a for loop, is a control statement, which means that what the actions that are belonging to this function are marked via indentation. Yeah, so I'm gonna open a new script, or rather save this as a new script, which I call initials2. And here I'm going to delete all the code that we don't need. And I'm going to write down define get initials because this is how our function is supposed to be called. Mm, let's call the input argument name, not very surprisingly, and then have a colon. And if we hit enter for new line, we immediately get indentation. because we're writing a function and we want the following lines to be part of this function, which is highlighted by indentation in Python. Okay, fine. So with that, I'm gonna copy my code, which I've written before, and just adapt it to the new situation. I'm gonna copy it into the indented part of the script. And here I have to replace username by name. And then first name and surname are extracted from the individual names. And the initials are being created from first and second name. So this is old code, which I don't need anymore. So I can like delete it and now basically uh, comment these lines. Because we have not yet used our function to generate it, the IDs of these persons. Okay, um, gonna run this function. I'm gonna run the script and the script is running fine which means that now the function should be available to us and we could apply it to some name. If we look into the variable explorer, we have new the names available here. So let's apply our function to this name. And what happens? Nothing's happened. So maybe the return value of the function is stored in this variable initials generated here in the function? No, that is not the case. Name initials is not defined. So where is the output of our function? 
Well, the answer is that we have not yet defined the output of our function. We still have to return the variable initials in order to signify that the function is not just doing something, but that it's also returning a value for further calculations. And we here want to return the variable initials. So to sum this up, dev and return when denoting functions are always fixed. Yeah? These are reserved words which you have to use. In everything else, you are free to choose what you want to do. You are free to choose your function name as soon as you later use the same function name. Um, you are free to choose the names of your arguments as long as in the body you correctly, in the, fun in the body of the function, you correctly refer to those arguments and you can freely choose the name of the output variable of the function or the return value. So let's run this once again and try this comment, command one more time. And now we see that it's working. Very nice. We get EM when we are inputting Elon Musk. So we can now add these as further lines to the script by simply applying the function to those other variables. And now I can also uncomment those print commands here, indicating that we want again want to see the results of our function get initials. Great. Okay, so with that, we are in principle ready to fulfill the additional requirements of our mm, of our objective. So remember that there should be two additional keyword arguments, and this is what we want to take care of first. So keyword argu arguments are specified like this. You switch to the place where you define the, uh, where you name the arguments of the function, and there you add another one, and then an equal sign and one. So this would mean that there is a keyword argument n in this function. And if it's not being specified by the user, it takes the value n. Now, what can we do with this keyword argument? Um, remember that n should be the number of initial characters to use from either to be used from either name. So we would here replace zero by zero to n. For example, if n is two, this would take the first two characters from the first name and the last name. Um, and you also remember that uh, zero to n is equivalent to colon n. Therefore, we can uh, even delete the zero here, and this would give us the first n elements. Okay, let's uh, run this function and try it out by, for example, asking for the first two letters. Okay, great. So now we get Elmu for Elon Musk, because we were taking the first two letters from either name. And we still get JD and JD for um, Jane Doe and John Doe. So maybe the right place to apply the keyword arguments would be here, uh, such that these two people are also distinguishable by their initials. The initials as returned by this function, I should say. Okay, so with that, we have implemented our first keyword argument, and there should be a second one, which is uppercase. So we're going to write uppercase here in the list of arguments, and this should be false by default. And what exactly do we have to do in order to make uh, uppercase take effect here? Uh, well, <clears throat> 
we need to check whether uppercase is true. And if that is the case, the initials should be uppercase. And if that's not the case, the initials should be lowercase before being returned by the function. OK, that makes sense. Um, by the way, since uppercase is a Boolean variable, um, we don't even need the equal equal true here. Yeah? If you have Boolean variables, uh, you can just check them by writing if x. Don't need to ask whether x is true when x can only be true or false. OK, let's also apply this keyword argument by asking for the lowercase initials for Elon Musk. OK, now we get obviously get lowercase initials for all of them because for it's also the true value. So let's here choose true and for the other ones leave it at the uh, at the default value. And that that case we would get EM in capital letters for Elon Musk and Jado and Jodo for the other two. There's a more elegant version of this um, check, which would be the following. So um, instead of, I'm gonna comment, I'm gonna copy this code and comment it. Um, so instead of um, recalculating the variable initials, under the cases of uh, the uppercase keyword argument, we can also directly copy return into those checks. So return lowercase initials in that case, sorry, return uppercase initials in that case, and return lowercase initials in this case. So this is a more elegant and shorter version, but which produces the same result. Okay, now we remember that there was one additional requirement in our objective, which was to um, produce an error message if the argument string does not contain exactly two names, two names. Okay, so before we do that, let me first introduce you to the general syntax for raising errors. So type raise and then the type of the error and an error message supplied as a string argument. So raise here is understood in the sense of raising an error or raising an issue. Um, an example for this would be to raise a value error. Mm, and let's Right, the error message, oh my god, the entire world is broken. So in such a case, this would be happening. Yeah. So this is basically the methodology that is behind all the error messages which we are already getting. Are already getting. It's writing the type of error here uh, in colored font and then the error message uh, that you've given as an input to this call. Good, so um, we can copy this into our script and it should be somewhere here, but um, we do not generate this error message all the time, but we only generate it um, if certain condition is fulfilled, namely if um, there's not exactly two names in the input string. How can we check that? Well, we have the input string segmented into individual words in the list of names. So we can calculate the list, uh, the length of names. And if that is unequal to two, 
then we want to raise the error message. And the error message should be the following. Um, name should contain exactly two names. run this and if I now call get initials with Elon Reef Musk, Elon Musk's maybe not so well known second name. We get an error message. Very nice. And we can even make this error message a bit more informative by also telling the user how many uh, names they have given. So let's define a message string. Name should contain exactly two names, but contains placeholder. So I'm here again using the uh, string formatting methodology and then in the error message, I'm going to format this string and put the numbers two and length names into the placeholders. Yeah? So curly brackets denote placeholders here and there, and the numbers two and length of names are put into these placeholders, into where these placeholders are, uh, in case the error message is elicited, elicited. So let's run the script again and do our erroneous call to the function. So we now get names should contain exactly two names, but contains three. Perfect. So with that, we have uh, made our function generate an error message, which can later be used with the try and accept structure, which you already know from an earlier session. So for example, we can write down here, try and then record the function get initials with uh, an invalid input string and in the case that there is a value error, print something. You have not used the correct number of arguments for get initials. Okay, so and because Elon Reef Musk uh, effectively generates a value error here, and we are checking for a value error before actually running this command, um, we get the desired output. You have not used the correct number of arguments. So to sum up, raise lets you produce error messages inside a function, for example, and try and accept lets you check for error messages and then use the fact that they are generated in order to make them make the program safe and do not let it crash. Yeah? So if we didn't have this try and accept structure, um, the program would directly crash at this point and we wouldn't even see the initials of the other people. So <clears throat> I'm going to comment this because it doesn't strictly belong to our program. And then we go on. Okay, so earlier in the seminar, I already told you about doc strings. And the doc string is always at the top of the program and is initiated with this th three double quotation marks. And it's also closed with three double quotation marks. And the nice thing about this is that you don't always need to write the hashtag at the beginning of the line and you write can write extensive um, documentation or comments for your code. So 
Let me open. Another program. So here in this program character, we have a doc string, which is basically the automatically generated one. And you can see that functions can also take doc string. So whenever you write a function, be sure to also include a doc string directly under the function definition. Um, some editors like this one here even give you um, template which you can fill with the specificalities of your function. And yeah, you should always um, write a doc string for the function um, for documentation purposes in case you or someone else later can comes back to this and wants to understand how the function exactly works. Um, here's another one. Yeah, so here I've copied the um, function that we have written into a into another script, which itself has a doc string, and the function also again has a doc string, and it is always recommended to include the following things into a function doc string. First, a brief um, description of what the function is doing. Then um, the description of the input arguments, description of the return values, and a usage example. If the function is also raising an error under some circumstances, this should also be documented. So into the function doc string, please write uh, the purpose of the function, usage example, list of arguments and what they are, list of return values and what they are, and if applicable, what kind of uh, error messages are being generated by this function. Okay, when you are writing a function, I'm gonna to switch to the online course material. When you're writing a function, it's um, most often good not to completely write it from scratch until it's 100% perfect, but to, to have intermediate steps uh, and a step-by-step -step construction of this function. So, Let's, for example, consider the case in which we want to write a function for implementing uh, the Pythagorean theorem, where you calculate the hypotenuse of a triangle um, from the other two sides by squaring them, adding them up, and then taking the square root of this. So if you would write a function um, implementing this calculation, what you would do, you would first write down example values for which you um, basically know what the result is, and then uh, do some first calculations using this um, example values, and also print the output of these calculations in order to check whether you are on the right track. If that is all okay, you can keep uh, adding steps and checking as you go along. So now we are calculating the squared sum, and then the square root of the squared sum and so on. And as soon as you know that your function or that the code that you've written is okay, you can transform this exemplary code, which you've been running and rerunning all the time, uh, into a function by just making a few modifications. And these modifications are to like here, remove this comment in order to make this an actual header of the function. Uh, then to delete the temporary variables, which we were using, which you were using just as examples, and to indent all the other lines um, as they are now part of the function, which is opened uh, via the header here. And finally, you have to um, turn the print command into a return, 
in order to let this function actually return this value and not just write it into the console. And with that, with that your uh, function is finalized and you can work with it. So then I want to uh, show you another script. Because um, maybe you were thinking that um, the same um, procedure that we just implemented using a function um, in order to calculate the initials for those three names that we were working with can also be implemented using a loop. Yeah? So instead of having the names as separate variables, you can also define them as a list and then create a for loop over this list and in each iteration of the loop, um, yeah, generate the initials and append them to a new list, which then contains all the initials. So first of all, this is absolutely okay. Um, the loop here is working correct and it gives us the correct result. However, uh, a function implementation is often to be preferred. Yeah? So uh, the loop that you're running is only executed once and it's not available for later purposes. So if you later in your coding encounter a situation where you again need to apply the same operation, operation you would then have to copy the code. And this uh, again produces duplicate and um, violates the don't repeat yourself principle. So uh, a function um, would be preferred in that case because you can then, you only have to write your code once and refer to the function from different parts of your program. Um, another, this is uh, done in this script where we are first calculating the initials for all the names in a list after having defined the function. And then later on, we compute the initials for just a single further name. And if we didn't have this function, we would have to, um, yeah, like duplicate this code, which would make our script considerably longer. Another advantage is that uh, functions can also be used in list comprehensions, yeah? So here you can see that we were constructing a list comprehension for each name, which is in the list usernames, calculate the initials and collect them into a new list. So this is very nice because it can make your programming very concise and short. Finally, um, last advantage of functions that we want to talk about today is uh, the fact that they can be used from another program. Yeah. So um, let's say I've written a function here in this script, and there is then a way to, from another script, reference the function in the script and use it for further operations uh, without manually copying it into the new script. So how this is being done is will be the topic of next week when we're dealing with modules in Python and how to import them uh, and use their components in your script. Okay. So with that, I want to say goodbye and um, thank you very much. Hope you enjoy the other videos as well.